Well, I want to welcome you all once more to Institute Encounters, which are the series of interviews the Texas Tech Institute for the Study of Western Civilization does with visiting guests. And we have an exceptionally interesting guest today, uh, a leading scholar uh, in all manner of military affairs, particularly affecting information technologies and cyber wars, but he is a man of parts and does a great many things, Dr. Paul, Paul Springer. Uh, Dr. Springer is Professor of Comparative Military Studies at the Air Force Staff and Command College in Montgomery, Alabama. He is the author of five books, and when you're as prolific as that, as at a young age, like Dr. Springer's, you know that even more books are on the way, and I'm told there are another five that will shortly see the light of day, and they cover a variety of realms in military studies. Uh, they cover terrorism, they cover robotic warfare, uh, they cover prisoners of war, uh, and the evolution of law pertaining to prisoners of war. Uh, and uh, apart and uh, above all that, uh, you have a strong interest in the Civil War and have written books that speak directly to the Civil War as well as touch on yes. serious aspects Absolutely. of it. And uh, while this uh, later today, uh, Professor uh, Springer will be lecturing on cyber war, and uh, those of you who see this interview posted on our website will also be able to see that lecture. Today we're going to take in this interview a somewhat different tact and talk about that subject of perennial interest to Americans, Americans of historical bent, the Civil War. Um, and I'd like to just begin by asking you, what do you think? the American Civil War is of such enduring interest to Americans? Well, I'd say, uh, obviously, it's the deadliest American war. Uh, more Americans are killed in the Civil War than almost every other war combined. Uh, certainly, there's a lot of heritage aspects of things. A lot of Americans are related to individuals that fought in the Civil War or were affected by the events of the Civil War. And it's a war that had a transformative effect on the future of the United States. It was really a question over whether or not the United States would continue as a single nation or would be split asunder. And had the Civil War turned out in a different fashion, imagine the effect it might have had upon world policy and world affairs over the next 150 years. Now you're something of a dissenter when it comes to your notions, your interpretations of the war and your assessment of the leading figures involved, and uh, one of those uh, dissents is lodged with respect to uh, the greatest icon, I suppose, certainly for the South, that the Civil War produced, Robert E. Lee. Um, you don't think he was that great a general, I take it, at least in terms of being the supreme commander, ultimately, of, uh, of the Confederate forces. You think that uh, he was flawed in that respect, and if I have that right, maybe you can expand on that. Uh, I think Robert E. Lee was probably the foremost practitioner of warfare as practiced by Napoleon Bonaparte 50 years before. A uh, consummate tactician, very skilled at the operational level of war. But as a strategist, Robert E. Lee was failing in a lot of regards. Uh, Robert E. Lee seemed to fail to discern the fundamental issues at hand for the Confederacy and the best way in which to pursue those. If the Confederate goal ultimately was to win its freedom from the remainder of the Union, then the Confederacy, in many ways, would have been best served to remain on the defensive, to essentially allow the, the Union to exhaust itself and its resources in an attempted conquest of an area significantly larger than all of Europe. But instead, Robert E. Lee chose to exhaust a lot of the resources of the South in two ill-fated invasions of the North. So I would argue that Lee, while an extremely brilliant innovator at the tactical level, he really struggled to, to pursue the strategic objectives. And of course, Lee was operating in a difficult political environment. Um, he had a commander-in-chief who felt more qualified to make military decisions than any of the generals within the command structure. Uh, but at the same time, Lee wielded enormous influence, and we, Lee made many of the decisions associated with placing the primary emphasis upon the eastern theater of the war, um, and again, choosing to, on a regular basis, go on both the strategic and the tactical offensive, both of which were extremely costly in manpower. So a lot of great military leaders probably would say that even when you're playing with a hand that's not quite as strong as your opponent, you don't want to be too passive. You want to worry the other side. I suppose that's what Lee was thinking of. 
when he decided to launch his two invasions of the North. And do I have that right? And if so, um, why couldn't you make a, a case for it? It didn't, didn't work out, obviously, but why wasn't it a plausible thing to try just to keep the North off balance? Well, obviously, historically speaking, we've got the, the 2020 vision of hindsight. Uh, Lee was a product of his education and of his experience. And at the time that Lee was active within the U.S. military, Napoleon was revered as, as the greatest military commander of all time, something that hasn't truly gone away. But the Napoleonic style of warfare had different technological limitations than what was available for, to the armies of the Civil War. The effective range of an infantryman in the Civil War had expanded up to almost 500 yards, whereas in Napoleonic Wars it was more like 50 yards of range. And that makes a fundamental difference in how you choose to array your forces and whether you choose to fling them at an entrenched enemy waiting for you, uh, particularly astride strong lines of supply. Lee seemed to be almost attempting to replicate the Napoleonic approach to warfare that had been practiced in Europe. Namely, which was to march into the enemy's areas, to live off of the land through a series of foraging, and to fall upon the enemy with superior numbers, either threatening or capturing their capital and imposing a peace. At no time did Lee really have the superior numbers to be able to practice this type of warfare. He certainly didn't have the capability to overwhelm the fortifications defending Washington, D.C., for example. And so he became obsessed with this notion of a decisive victory on enemy soil. In other ways, Lee was somewhat the product of his heritage. The United States had obviously won its independence from Britain, and for many of the members of the Confederacy, they saw their fight as a second war of American independence. So, a lot of people at that time pointed to the Battle of Saratoga as the great decisive turning point in the war against Britain. After all, at Saratoga, for the first time in 400 years, a British field army had been compelled to surrender. And it had done so to a colonial army with a massive amount of militia support. But this decisive victory at Saratoga had also brought about foreign intervention. It was that victory at Saratoga that convinced the French that the American colonists might be able to win their independence. And as a result, the French began to supply enormous amounts of materiel and eventually significant armies and navies to the American breakaway attempt. Lee and a lot of the proponents of the Confederacy, who thought an offensive strategy might lead to a victory on American soil, were always chasing the idea that the British or the French might decide to recognize the Confederacy and even directly intervene but he's really discounting the fact that the British are not willing to recognize a slave power mm. that's attempting to break away, even though it might have served British national interests to weaken the power of the Americans on the North American continent. It would have been very, very politically difficult for a British government to openly side with a slave power that was attempting to fight a war of independence from a largely abolitionist government, particularly after the release of the Emancipation Proclamation. So were there, um, within the upper ranks of both the Confederate Army and the Confederate Cabinet, uh, proponents for that? Most people would say in the American Revolution, despite Saratoga, that Washington's strategy was exactly what you're saying Lincoln's strategy should have been, to just sort of wait, keep an army in being, wear down the resolve of the other side, uh, hope for favorable diplomatic developments, and, and, and win the war. Um, simply by kind of enduring uh, longer uh, than the far off power, which perhaps you know the same thing that the Vietnamese did in in, in Vietnam, North Vietnamese did in Vietnam. Were there were there were there people in the higher councils of the Confederacy who wanted to adopt that more uh, Washingtonian approach? Well, ultimately, what you're referring to is called a Fabian strategy. It's a reference to Roman attempts to hold off the invasion of Hannibal during the Second Punic War. And it's been the traditional style of warfare that has to be adopted by a weaker power when confronting an aggressive, larger neighbor. And so Lee was certainly aware of what Washington had done. Uh, Lee believed that an aggressive stance might actually bring about victory in a, a more decisive or more rapid fashion. But yes, in hindsight, I would certainly argue that they would have been far more likely to succeed attempting to exhaust and attrit the Union forces, essentially sapping the Union's will to continue the war. There were proponents of that strategy, and for a short period of time, Lee was actually a proponent of that strategy in 1861 and early 62. However, it didn't help that the popular media, of the Richmond press in particular, mocked Robert E. Lee, uh, referring to him as the king of spades for his preference 
to create earthworks and entrenchments mm -hmm. rather than relying upon what's often referred to as the cult of the bayonet, the offensive action and the notion of driving the enemy before you. Uh, in particular, the, the, the Confederates are almost victims of their early successes. They became convinced that Confederate soldiers were inherently more capable than the Union troops, were higher motivated than the Union troops, uh, and that in any given clash, any open field pitched battle, the Union troops would be likely to, to break and run. Uh, but the face of modern war that they began to develop over the course of the, the early campaign really demonstrated that there was an enormous advantage to being able to entrench and wait for the enemy to approach. Uh, the most lopsided victories throughout the Civil War tended to be those where one side was caught in the open and the other side was able to fire with impunity. Now there are exceptions to that rule. Uh, Ulysses S. Grant managed to actually compel the surrender of Fort Henry and Donelson and later the surrender of Vicksburg. And each of those surrenders took significant numbers of troops into Union POW camps to later be exchanged for Union forces or to be held out for, for the remainder of the war. But Lee wasn't facing a situation where he was going to be under siege and, and without secure logistical lines. Um, in particular, when Lee takes command during the Seven Days Battle, he actually has McClellan's forces largely bottled up on the peninsula. Uh, that's McClellan's own fault for choosing a, a really terrible axis of advance. But it doesn't change the fact that Lee is inflicting enormous defeats upon McClellan even before he tries to switch over to the offensive. Uh, on the occasions where Lee really takes the offensive, whether it's the strategic offensive to move into the north or the tactical offensive to launch the final assault at Gettysburg or to launch the attacks at Chancellorsville, that's when the Confederacy really begins to lose significant numbers of troops, and that's something they just can't replace. The numerical disparity gets even worse. They can't afford to pay a one-to-one -one casualty ratio, but when they go on the offensive, it tends to be a two, three, or even four-to-one ratio which means the last thing that they should be doing is expending enormous amounts of troops in these futile assaults. So you're sort of suggesting that Lee starts off with a more appropriate attitude to the Confederacy's strategic situation, and then abandons it partly because he's sort of heady with victory, and partly because he's being egged on by a press and a president uh, who are kind of looking for the big spectacular victory that will uh, carry the Confederacy to its independence. It's, it's kind of a, a sequence of events that, that might have turned out differently. There seems to be an enormous amount of urgency in the Confederate war effort, mm -hmm. a belief that they need to win and they need to win quickly, when in reality when you're facing a larger and more powerful enemy, ultimately the decision of whether or not the war will continue largely falls to that enemy. So you brought up the idea of the Vietnamese example. In that particular case, there's no possibility that North Vietnam is going to launch some type of an invasion of the United States. Uh, it's, it's outside the realm of possibility. The only way North Vietnam can win that war is for the United States to withdraw its forces and essentially concede the ground. The same is true for the American Revolution. The British have far greater resources they can potentially draw upon, uh, but at no time do they really try to mobilize the country for the pacification of the American colonies. By the time the British really get serious about the effort, they're now facing a war that involves the French. Any time you face that type of a situation, your goal is to change the calculus, the decision making. Your goal is to influence the minds of the leaders, the political decision makers, in that larger, more powerful enemy. It's not to attempt to defeat them on the battlefield. That's an almost suicidal approach. Well, of course, this has implications for America's involvement abroad today since we're almost always in the same position as the British were uh, in facing the American Revolution, um, and I guess to some degree as the North was in, in sort of facing the South. Um, have we learned the lessons that are present in the Civil War? Uh, do American political leaders understand or do they recognize most of these wars as, as things that have to be won quickly before the fatigue factor sets in, or uh, have we been oblivious to those lessons? Well, there's a couple of main factors here. There's a decided tendency in American politics to value the short-term gain or the short-term solution uh, and to really fail to embrace the, the longer-term strategies that mm -hmm. might bring greater rewards. But the secondary issue, of course, in modern warfare for the United States is the notion that we haven't declared war since World War II. 
And when you declare war, you effectively turn the presidency into a, a bit of a dictatorship uh, with almost unlimited powers. Those powers aren't really enumerated in the Constitution. But in practice, we've seen presidents that were able to do things like suspend the writ of habeas corpus, as Abraham Lincoln did. Now, that was eventually overturned by the Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court didn't have any enforcement mechanism to actually force Lincoln to comply with their will. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was able to engage in enormous amounts of deficit spending on a wide variety of military projects that Congress had no direct oversight about, and was able to do so largely without any form of domestic opposition of note. Uh, now, after the fact, we could see that we had spent billions of dollars on the development of atomic weapons, billions more on the development of, of aircraft that could actually deliver those weapons. But at the time, there was nobody trying to stop that, or nobody threatening to turn off the, the financial spigot, if you will. But in the modern era, Congress has been loath to declare war on any foreign state. Now, there's an argument to be made that the UN Charter prohibits it, but even that notwithstanding, Congress is very nervous about turning over that level of power to a president. Because after all, the only mechanism in the Constitution to end a war is for the president to negotiate a treaty which then has to be ratified by the Senate. But you can envision a situation where a president refused to negotiate an end to a conflict, in which case the president would effectively not be relinquishing the dictatorial powers that he or she had received. So those problems aside, one of the things that you to forego if you don't declare war is the psychological mobilization and also the political concentration of domestic power that goes along with that kind of thing. Uh, and so you're kind of pointing to that as one of our key vulnerabilities when it comes to our fighting post-Second World War conflicts? So it's not just the psychological mobilization that we're talking about here, it's also the, the coercive power of the federal government. During World War II, for example, the federal government took for itself the power to essentially convert every American industry over to war production. Uh, you don't find 1943 Ford model vehicles because they don't exist. Uh, the Ford Motor Company converted entirely over to war production. And the federal government not only determined what you would produce and what resources you would have to engage in that production, it also determined how much of a profit you could actually turn from that war production, and in many cases, what type of wages you would be expected to pay to the workers that were engaged in the production. That's not something you can do without a declaration of war. Uh, regardless of the patriotism of the industries involved, right now, if the president tried to go to the Ford Motor Company and say, we need you to stop producing Ford vehicles because we need you to produce the following armaments to, so that we can engage in a conflict, the Ford Motor Company would absolutely refuse, unless it was going to be infinitely more lucrative for them to engage in the government contracts. And even then, given the type of market share that they would lose long term, it's likely that they would actually reject any such request. So are you suggesting that uh, part of our fault is our unwillingness to declare war? Or is it the fact that we get involved in conflicts where we really don't think it rises to the level of a declared war, and then we fall beneath both stools. We don't, we, do, we, 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 we don't have the ability to conduct the war in such a manner as to lead to victory, uh, but nonetheless we fight a war uh, and then end up with an outcome that uh, is unsatisfying. I think it's a little bit of both. Uh, to a certain extent we have a tendency to fight against non-state actors and you really can't declare war on a group like the Islamic State or Al-Qaeda without actually creating a de facto recognition of them as, a, as an independent state, which is not something we're willing to do. So part of the problem is you really can't declare war on the types of enemies that we've been engaging. Part of the problem is there's not the political will to declare war, which for the United States tends to lead to an all-out effort at conquest and subjugation, an expectation of unconditional surrender, that's something that the United States has always been hesitant, very, very hesitant to engage in. But now, uh, there's not such a, a war in the world that the United States thinks it's in its own best national interests to fight. I would argue that if the types of military adventurism that you want to engage in don't rise to the level of needing a declaration of war, then perhaps that's not the type of military adventurism you should be engaging in. When the Civil War began, to come back to the Civil War, um, what did the, um, the leading lights of uh, northern um, diplomacy and politics and uh, military leadership, 
think the challenge was? Did they expect something a lot easier than they encountered, or did they have a kind of long-term view that more reasonably assessed what the nature of the challenge was? Lincoln's getting a wide variety of advice from, from a whole host of different actors. Um, in particular, he turns to his military advisor, the commanding general of the United States Army, Winfield Scott, a veteran of multiple wars, and he asks him his opinion about how this conflict might be carried out. So the first thing Scott announces is that he's far too old and far too decrepit to be able to carry out this kind of a conflict because Scott understood that this was going to be a long, far-reaching civil war, that this would not be something quickly dispensed with. So Scott makes a recommendation that the United States effectively declare a blockade of the Confederate coastline and then begin a drive to squeeze the Confederacy on multiple fronts trying to overwhelm all of the different forces that the Confederates might be able to array. In particular, Scott thought it would be important to cut control of the Mississippi River. After doing that, he thought a drive towards Atlanta, perhaps originating out of eastern Tennessee, would be important, essentially breaking the Confederacy down into smaller units and then squeezing each one into submission. The press dubbed this the Anaconda Plan, uh, Lincoln immediately refused to pursue this type of a far-reaching strategy, which Scott thought would require at least 500,000 troops to be carried out. Um, and Lincoln was unwilling to pursue that type of a long-term solution. Eventually, it's effectively what the Union strategy wound up becoming, if only by accident. Scott also recommended turning command over to one of the younger officers that were available, in particular his protege, Robert E. Lee was Scott's choice, and Lee was actually offered command of the Union Army to put down the rebellion on April 15th. So Scott gave some very good advice. He did. He did. Unfortunately, he didn't give the advice quite soon enough. Lee was offered command of the Army on April 15th, but Virginia seceded from the Union on April 17th, before Lee had actually responded to the offer. As a result, Lee resigned his command and immediately returned to offer his services to his home state. There were other individuals in the Lincoln administration that thought the war could actually be carried out much more quickly. These ranged from military officers uh, to political uh, individuals uh, who thought that a, a mere show of force would probably be enough to cow the budding Confederacy and put to rest any notions of rebellion. Uh, Lincoln, for his own part, decided the most important thing would be to determine who stood on which side of the budding conflict. At the beginning of the war, the entire United States Army stood at barely 20,000 officers and men, and of those, a significant portion were drawn from the South and might be expected to support their home states. Lincoln knew that the most important thing to determine would be who was actually going to support the Confederacy, and as a result, he decided that in order to put down the revolt, he would need to call for 75,000 three-month volunteers, and those volunteers would be drawn from every single state that had remained loyal to the Union. Now, this call for troops to help put down the insurrection actually caused the secession of four more states immediately after that call went out. Lincoln see that as a real possibility? Lincoln saw that as an absolute possibility, but also a necessity uh, to know whether these states would actually remain loyal or not. And when push came to shove, Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Arkansas all seceded in the aftermath of this call for troops. While it was unfortunate to lose very populous states, um, in particular, North Carolina actually contributed more troops to the Confederate cause than any other state. That was a necessary, uh, shall we say, clarification of the battle lines. And without that, Lincoln wouldn't have known uh, really the epic size, the monumental task that mm -hmm. lay before him. Obviously, those 75,000 volunteers weren't nearly enough to put down the rebellion, particularly as it spread to four more border states. But it did bring things into a sharp focus for Lincoln. So once the initial campaigns fail, we got Camp Manassas campaign, which, which, which collapses at the Battle of Bull Run, um, does that then kind of sober up the high command of the North? And do they realize at that stage that they're in for the long haul and have to start thinking differently about how the war is going to be waged? Well, the first Battle of Bull Run, as it's called in the North, uh, was certainly an eye-opening event for Lincoln and his advisors. They realized that this was going to be a much larger struggle than they had previously assumed. They had presumed that it might be possible to effectively march on the Confederate capital of Richmond in a show of force, drive away any potential Confederate defenders, 
uh, and proclaim victory and bring about the surrender of, of these Confederate forces and possibly the peaceful reconciliation of their political differences. After First Bull Run, it's clear that a much larger force is going to be required. The Confederates are far more capable than expected, they're far more numerous than expected, and they've got outstanding military leadership that has chosen to resign their commissions within the United States Army and side with their home states. So yes, uh, the immediate aftermath of First Bull Run is followed by a renewed call for more than 100,000 volunteers. And those volunteers are going to be expected to serve for one year rather than the short three months that had previously been called for. And those calls for volunteers are going to continually expand, such that by the end of the war, the United States is going to put about two million troops into uniform, including the incorporation of 200,000 African American troops into the Union Army. And there's also a change in the top leadership in that McClellan is brought in to command the Union forces in the in the East. Uh, uh, is is he a choice that reflects this notion that the war is going to be a much longer drawn out affair? Is his approach one that uh, looks off into the distance and, and and sees a protracted effort? George McClellan is an interesting case. He'd been the West Point class of 1846. He was the top graduate of that class. He was widely regarded as one of the brightest students that had ever come into the United States military. Uh, McClellan had eventually resigned his command and built a very successful railroad empire. Uh, but when the war broke out, McClellan offered his services to the government. Now, as one of the, the smartest shining stars of the West Point legacy, a young man full of vigor who was often being styled as the young Napoleon uh, or the Napoleon in the West, uh, McClellan seemed to be this new face of, of young war. And when you consider that Napoleon engaged in most of his conquests while a man in his 20s and 30s, it made sense that a younger man might be carrying out this, this much larger style of conflict. On the other hand, McClellan was temperamentally unsuited to actual field command. He was very gifted at building, organizing, training, and equipping an enormous army, but actually putting it into motion was more of a fundamental problem for McClellan. Having built an enormous army, he was too scared to risk the possibility of its destruction. At every turn, McClellan saw enormous opposing forces. He constantly imagined larger armies might be arrayed against him than the Confederacy could possibly have produced. As a result, he actually bought time for Confederate leaders to entrench their positions, to bring in more troops, to train up more volunteers, uh, to bring in additional weaponry from outside of the United States. And so in some ways, he ceded the initiative to them and opened the possibility for his own defeat. Now, there were some Southerners who chose to fight for the North. Um, Admiral Farragut, I believe, was one. Uh, Scott himself, I think, came from the South. Um, say Robert Lee had decided to throw his lot in with the Union, would he have been a more effective commander for the North than he was for the South? I think Robert E. Lee probably would have been a far more successful commander than anyone prior to Grant serving as the commanding general of the Union Army, in part because Robert E. Lee understood what to do when he possessed an enormous advantage, and he would have possessed enormous advantages in terms of manpower, industrial might, railroad trackage and railroad materials such as locomotives and stock cars. Um, I think Lee, given all of those significant advantages, probably would have been able to devise a very successful campaign. At his heart, Lee was a very aggressive commander, and that can be a wonderful thing if you have an enormous numerical superiority. If, however, you're outnumbered by the enemy, it becomes a very dangerous trait to possess because you may be willing to take risks that are ill-advised. So you would argue that uh, Joe Johnston, who preceded Lee, I think, as the commander of the Army of Virginia until he was wounded, would have made on the whole, perhaps would have made on the whole, a better commander over the long term for the South. Joseph E. Johnston failed to inspire the type of loyalty and subordinates that Robert E. Lee did. He was a much more cold individual. Um, Johnston understood the need to remain on the defensive, to inflict tactical defeats upon the invaders and the aggressors. And so in that regard, Johnston was a logical choice, given his mindset and his background and his experience. Uh, both Lee and Johnston had graduated in the West Point class of 1829. They had both served as engineers over the, the period of their, their service prior to the Civil War. Both of them had seen conflict in multiple theaters. But Johnston 
had a personal disagreement with uh, with Jefferson Davis that went all the way back to their days at West Point. Jefferson Davis was actually one class ahead of Lee and Johnston, and the two of them, Johnston and Davis, had hated each other for their entire lives. Uh, they just immediately disagreed from the, the day they met at West Point, and that never stopped. Um, Davis had served as the Secretary of War in the 1850s, and he had personally targeted Johnston for uh, a few unpleasant assignments. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and this animosity really prevented the two of them from working very well together. I think temperamentally, Johnston would have been more capable of carrying out an entirely defensive strategy, one determined to attrit the Union forces as much as possible at every step of the way without risking his own force. And we see Johnston attempt that in the defense of Atlanta, where he's facing an enormously numerically superior enemy commanded by William T. Sherman. Johnston holds out and he inflicts as many casualties as he can, but he doesn't fight a suicidal resistance to the very last. When the, the situation becomes untenable, he withdraws his forces, understanding that the critical center of gravity is the possession of his army, at that time the Army of Tennessee. As long as his army remained essentially a body, uh, a threat in being, the war continued in the West. Were his army to be completely destroyed, to be annihilated, uh, then the Union could pour all of its forces towards the, the campaign in Richmond. Of course, Davis blamed Johnston for the loss of Atlanta, withdrew him from command, and replaced him with the hyper-aggressive commander John Bell Hood, uh, one of the Texans from, from right here in, mm -hmm. in the Lubbock region, not really, but uh, John Bell Hood was so obsessed mm -hmm. with, with being an aggressive general that he essentially flung all of his forces away in a series of very poorly conceived attacks, and the Army of the Tennessee, for all intents and purposes, ceased to exist, which then allowed Sherman to commence his march to the sea, which allowed Sherman to then move up through the Carolinas. And when Sherman was bent on inflicting enormous destruction, he was actually planning to fall upon Lee's forces from the rear if Lee had not withdrawn from the Richmond area and, and eventually moved towards what became the surrender at Appomattox. So you don't think that the South's defeat was foreordained? They had the ability to bleed the North conceivably to the point where the authority of its government would just sort of fall to a point where whoever was running it at that time would sort of be willing to sit down and negotiate. I don't think there's any such thing as a foreordained conclusion in any conflict. Mm -hmm. If there was, there would have been no reason to fight the vast majority of conflicts in human history. The fact of the matter is, yes, the South was outnumbered, yes, the North had a significant amount of industry, but what the, what the North had to do in order to win the war was bring about the complete and utter subjugation of the South, conquer an area almost equivalent to the, the size of, of Europe, uh, almost equivalent to, to the Union's entire territory itself, uh, and to do so with essentially a two-to-one manpower advantage. But the South really didn't need to engage in any type of conquest in the North, and it didn't even need to hold on to all of its territory. It needed to hold on to enough territory to bring out about some form of negotiated settlement. That settlement could have led to the reunification of the, the country, or it might very well have led to two separate countries, uh, with a hostile border between them, or, or possibly even a, a relatively demilitarized border between them. The fact of the matter is, the South chose to use its force in a very futile attempt to force the decision uh, as quickly as possible, rather than holding on and recognizing the longer the war went on, the more likely that northern political will would be exhausted. You've also written uh, about the kind of afterlife of the war in the form of what happened to many of the leading southern military figures. Um, you're still in the process of doing that research. Part of it has looked at, interestingly from our point of view, I suppose, uh, they were higher education careers, which many had, and uh, you're continuing to look at some of the service they did abroad. That's not a story that's been widely told, though it sounds like a very interesting one. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about it? Well, I'm in the, the preliminary stages of writing a couple of manuscripts about post-Civil War service, of, in particular a lot of these Confederate veterans. Um, a lot of the Confederate leaders within the Confederate Army were effectively bankrupt at the end of the war. Uh, in, in some cases, their personal fortunes had been exhausted by the war itself. In other cases, their property had been confiscated by the federal government. So they're not really capable of returning to any type of an agrarian life, for the most part. The vast majority of them don't have the, the hard capital resources necessary to open any kind of businesses. 
And so a lot of them begin casting about for how they might be able to essentially maintain a, a minimum standard of living, um, a, a position within society of a certain degree of importance and influence. They were banned initially from holding any kind of elective office, uh, though eventually that ban will be lifted and Joseph E. Johnston will actually go on to serve as a congressman. Uh, but an awful lot of them, essentially, because they're well educated at West Point and because there's a movement within the United States to establish agricultural and mechanical colleges through the Morrill Land Grant Program, a lot of them, having been trained at West Point to serve as engineers, find themselves to be qualified to serve as engineering faculty on the new schools being established throughout the Midwest and the South. And so what we see is, is a burgeoning growth of higher education, uh, state schools being founded, expanded, or rebuilt in the aftermath of the war, and then their faculties being filled with these former Confederate officers, these veterans who had served in the independence movement and who are now moving into positions of higher education in a wide variety of academic disciplines. Some of the, the veterans of the Confederate Army, and, and some of the Union veterans for that matter too, find that they're unwilling to give up the martial lifestyle. The vast majority of them are not going to be admitted back into the United States Army, though there will be a few that eventually are reinstated back into the U.S. military forces. But an awful lot of them will choose to go overseas rather than living under the occupation of the victorious Union Army. And some of them will choose to take service in foreign militaries, um, in particular operating in mercenary companies. Uh, and this is a, an age-old tradition, the idea of hiring foreign military forces to serve as augmentees or enablers for your own native forces. Uh, was certainly not a new concept, but here you have thousands of veterans who have engaged in the, the most modern of conflicts to date with enormous industrial production being poured into the conflict with significant changes in both strategic and tactical approaches to the engagement in war who are now able to sell their services and sell their knowledge to the highest bidder. Could you give us some examples? Well, there's an enormous number of these Confederate veterans that wind up serving, for example, in military forces operating in Egypt. The Khedive of e Egypt is going to hire thousands of Confederate mercenaries, including some fairly prominent com Confederate military officers. Uh, there will be naval forces around the world that are trying to hire former Confederate naval captains. Um, then, of course, there's an awful lot of Civil War veterans that wind up taking service in Japan. Uh, the various feuding warlord clans. Uh, thank you, Tom Cruise, for popularizing this for American audiences. Um, and, and the ones who go into higher education, uh, how successful are they? Well, this really starts at the top. Robert E. Lee becomes the new president of Washington College, and he'll serve in that role for the five years between the end of the Civil War and his death. In that role, he's actually going to revitalize this, this relatively small school in Lexington, Virginia. After his death, it'll be renamed Washington and Lee, and it's now Washington and Lee University. This is the same town that houses the Virginia Military Institute, mm -hmm. uh, where Thomas Stonewall Jackson's body is interred. So we have this nexus of Confederate leadership right there in Lexington, Virginia. Robert E. Lee will be succeeded as the president of Washington College by his son, who had also been a general in the Confederate Army. But there are other Confederate leaders. Um, you have Brigadier General Lawrence Sullivan Ross within the state of Texas, for example, who becomes the president of Texas A&M University and who is credited on that institution's campus as having saved the school from being closed by the state legislature. You have other individuals like Daniel Harvey Hill, uh, who becomes a very prominent educator. He's going to wind up founding a couple of military colleges. Um, there are a number of, of these, these Confederate officers that are going to apply for faculty positions who aren't prominent, well-known generals. So were you to go and look at the, the faculty applications for the very first faculties at schools like Texas A&M, the University of Texas, Louisiana State University, which at the time was the Louisiana Seminary, and other schools throughout the South, the vast majority of the early faculty applications consist of an eight or ten page long handwritten letter, the vast majority of which details their service in the Civil War on behalf of the Confederacy, before a final paragraph or two explains their qualifications to come to the school and serve as the, the professor of practical philosophy, or the professor of natural history, or the professor of geometry. These individuals are drawing upon their experiences having been a student at West Point, or in some cases the Virginia Military Institute, and are attempting to leverage that educational experience into the opportunity to serve as a faculty member. This is long before you see the propagation of enormous numbers of, of terminal degrees. The, the PhD is not the norm, obviously, in the 1860s and 1870s. 
And because there are very few engineering schools anywhere in the world, much less in the United States, and because the Moral Land Grant Act requires that those state institutions set up with Moral Act funds involve an engineering component, now, this is actually the perfect opportunity for these West Point graduates in particular to establish new departments studying the very same subjects that they had been taught in preparation for a military career. And despite having not having doctorates, they nonetheless did have Latin and, and perhaps some Greek as well. Um, they actually had Latin and French. Mm -hmm. uh, French was absolutely required at the academy. It was one of the foremost subjects of the academy, in large part because most of, of the military treatises of the day were actually written in French. So were you to want to study the precepts of Napoleonic warfare, for example, you might very well have re relied upon Antoine Jomini's Art of War. You might have also relied upon Dennis Hart Mahan's not only translation, but modification of many of the ideas from Jomini into his Outposts, which is one of the seminal texts that's being used at West Point and, and is used for the education of, of most of the, the Civil War generals on both sides. And what about the uh, former Union uh, generals? What, what do they do when the war is over? The army is downsized, so I suppose that a lot of them don't end up with births, or at least of, with the rank that they were accustomed to. What do they do? Well, the, there's an enormous number of union generals uh, that are going to move into other elements, obviously, of society, whether it be political elected office. Grant, obviously, is going to wind up serving as the Secretary of War and then serving as the President of the United States. Uh, there are going to be others that choose to stay in union uniform. The vast majority of, of union generals do not hold regular commission rank as general officers. So we can take one of the most famous examples is George Armstrong Custer. Now, this is an individual that had graduated from West Point at the last position in his class in 1861. By the end of the war, at the age of 26, he's a major general serving in a cavalry command on behalf of the Union, making him one of the highest ranking generals at one of the lowest ages that you've ever seen in American history. But as the military downsizes in the aftermath of the war, there's not a major general slot available for General Custer. Custer is essentially given one of two options. He can either accept a demotion in rank to his permanent rank, which would make him a 26-year-old lieutenant colonel, or he can retire with honors as a brevet major general, meaning a wartime promotion to major general. Custer chooses to remain in the military lifestyle, and he takes the demotion to lieutenant colonel, but the vast majority of the personnel under his command still refer to him as General Custer all the way to the end of his days. It's an honorific, it was a wartime promotion, but it's something that's certainly been internalized for many of the personnel. Are there many Union generals who go into education? There are some. Um, it's not as compelling of an opportunity for Union generals because the vast majority of them have better opportunities. Um, it's not to say that there's something wrong with going into education, but at the time, being a professor at a college campus was actually not a particularly lucrative profession. Um, it tended to include housing, it tended to include board, and it tended to include, it tended to include a fairly small stipend uh, that would be paid out over the course of the year. Most of these schools that are being founded or refounded in the aftermath of the Civil War at one time or another are actually going to struggle to pay their faculty. Mm -hmm. They will tend to be in arrears for, for months or even years of faculty pay. Uh, so it's not a particularly glamorous profession. Um, it's a calling for a few, but the vast majority of, of Union generals are able to go and do other things. Now, there are some Union generals that have a significant educational background. For example, the hero of Little Round Top at Gettysburg, who you might have been familiar with, uh, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. He actually retires as a major general. He's actually the one that accepts the surrender of the Confederate Army at Appomattox, uh, which was essentially an honor bestowed upon him by Grant for his successful wartime service. But he had previously served as a professor at Bowdoin College up in Maine, and he's actually going to re return back to Maine and, and eventually serve as the president of the very same college. He'll also be elected the governor of Maine and, and go on to other political offices, which shows that he had some significant opportunities. Many of these Union leaders could parlay their, their mil military wartime service into higher elected office. And for a long period of time, uh, from the end of the Civil War all the way into the 20th century, uh, you effectively had to have served in the Union Army in some capacity uh, to even be considered as a possible commander-in-chief for the entire United States. I believe the only example that did not was Grover Cleveland. Uh, everyone was else. Was a Democrat. Who was a Democrat, uh, who was also from Ohio, so he was from the right portion of the country. Uh, but the possibility of, of serving as the president without having been in the military, you either needed to be young enough that it wasn't an option, or 
uh, you needed to be able to demonstrate a certain degree of service. If you go to the Battle of Antietam's modern battlefield, you can find an enormous monument to William McKinley. Now, McKinley at the Battle of Antietam had actually served as a supply sergeant. Uh, the one thing that he had really done was provide donuts and hot, hot coffee to troops in the line. But if you read Under this, fire. Not, not you, clear, huh? <laughs> if you read the monument at Antietam, it makes great reverence, uh, great references to his hero, heroism, his bravery, his mm -hmm. ability to supply the forces under fire. But, but in reality, when you dig a little deeper, uh, what he was doing was providing the meals. Didn't he get that Congressional Medal of Honor? Eventually, there is a push to award McKinley the Congressional Medal of Honor. Uh, in large part, it is, a, it, is a, it is a political maneuver. Uh -huh. um, and these types of political maneuvers do happen on a regular basis. So one can look up the, the, civil, one can look up the Silver Star uh, Award that was given to Lyndon Baines Johnson. Johnson was a, was a reservist who was a serving congressperson who decided to go on a fact-finding tour of the war in the Pacific. Uh, it was a very dangerous place for him to be, and there was certainly no possibility that the Army or the Navy was going to tolerate the idea of losing a congressman in the war against Japan. So they put him on a bomber aircraft, and shortly after the bomber aircraft took off, it developed certain mechanical problems. Uh, Johnson, at all times, was a supernumerary uh, a passenger on board the plane. He had no official functions, but when the plane landed, he was given a citation for his superior bravery, for his leadership of the crew, uh, in responding to a, an in-flight emergency and getting everyone back together. And Johnson wore his Silver Star designation for the rest of his political career. Uh, he, he traded upon it, he referred to it constantly, and one has to wonder whether he honestly believed that he engaged in some form of in, enormous heroism that would merit such a high award as the Silver Star. Uh, now, there's, a, there's recent movement to award Teddy Roosevelt the, the Medal of Honor for his actions. Hasn't that succeeded or not? As a matter of fact, the, the historical commission made up of military historians recommended against the award, and so the award went through naturally, and he received the Medal of Honor. Do you think he deserved it? I don't think that uh, Teddy Roosevelt did anything, well, I don't think he did anything at all at uh, San Juan Hill, but even at Kettle Hill, he didn't do anything that would rise to the traditional level of the Medal of Honor. One of the complicating factors is that there really weren't a lot of medals to choose from in 1898. Mm -hmm. uh, in the Civil War, for all intents and purposes, the Medal of Honor is the only medal that can be given out. And it's given out for things like um, an entire unit that re-enlists in, in, in mm -hmm. service mm -hmm. on behalf of the Union. Uh, that results in more than 400 medals of honor being, being uh, awarded to the unit as a whole. Uh, and that creates some significant controversies long term over whether or not that rises to the, the traditional standard level. There was some suggestion of attempting to take the medals back. There have been other medals that have been rescinded and then sometimes reinstated. Uh, there's a long history of, of controversy associated with the Medal of Honor, and so sometimes you have to put it in the context of the day. Uh, but in reality, Teddy Roosevelt did wonderful service as a, a colonel. He organized a unit of Rough Riders, he brought them to the war, uh, and he fought his unit well. But that's exactly what you expect for the, the, the colonel commanding a regiment of cavalry. Uh, so nothing that he did was so above and beyond the call of duty mm -hmm. as to necessarily merit the award of the, the highest military honor that the United States can bestow. Did many former Union and Confederate officers, uh, senior officers, go into business careers after the war? There's a lot of union officers that get involved in business careers. It's a, it's a much higher bar to entry for Confederates because, again, the vast majority of them do not have access to the types of capital that mm -hmm. they might require to open any kind of a business. So you've probably heard of the term carpetbagger, for example, the idea of some Yankee capitalist coming down to the, the Confederacy and setting up shop and, and turning an enormous profit off of supplying goods and services that the South can't supply for itself. Uh, and that just reminds us that it often requires money if you want to make money. And the vast majority of Confederate military leaders had invested their own personal fortunes into the war effort. Uh, if you're left holding Confederate war bonds at the end of the war, there's no Confederate government to pay them off. And there's certainly no possibility that the United States government is going to reward you for your decision to invest money in an insurrection mm -hmm. against government control. And so the war actually serves to bankrupt the vast majority of the leaders that are invested in, in carrying out this conflict. You can't think of many Union generals who become 
the super rich of the Gilded Age. It doesn't seem to happen. You, you don't see a lot of former Union generals becoming the super rich of the Gilded Generation, but that's partly because there's not that many super rich. Uh, and the vast majority of those that become super rich in the 1880s and 1890s were far too young to have served as generals mm -hmm. in the Union Army. Most of the generals of the Union Army, in particular, tend to be older than their Confederate counterparts. Uh, and, and when we say most of the generals, we tend to think of the field commanders. But the reality is there's an enormous number of staff generals out there uh, who are fulfilling vital roles, and, and many of whom are going to remain in service after the Civil War is over, like Custer, uh, accepting a, a lower rank in order to maintain their service to the country. Uh, so, yes, there are, there are some Union generals that become heavily involved in business, but when you talk about these super wealthy, there's only a handful of them, uh, some of whom are immigrants, and many of whom are far too young to have reached the highest ranks in the Union Army. Who do you think is among, at least, the most underrated of Union or Confederate generals? Uh, I don't tend to think of any of them as being particularly underrated, in part because this is a very studied war, uh, and there are partisans that, that engage in debates on behalf of, of their chosen champion uh, throughout the, the academic community. I think that the reputations of some of the individuals tend to rise and fall. So James Longstreet, for a while, uh, was reviled as, as the, the loser of Gettysburg, uh, when in reality, uh, Longstreet was largely being punished for his political decisions after the war was over. Then there was a renaissance in the, the 1990s suggesting that Longstreet was actually the most gifted of Confederate generals because he understood the value of entrenchments probably more than anyone else because he understood that this was likely the, the future face of modern warfare uh, as, as was amply demonstrated in World War I. There are a lot of generals uh, whose reputations have gone unsullied that, that might deserve a little more opprobrium than they've received, but, but in reality there's, there's enough debate out there about the vast majority of generals that, that I don't think that there's any that have been completely marginalized and forgotten by history, and you're hard pressed to find um, any of them that, that I think have become truly uh, forgotten that ought to be remembered. If you look at the entire extent of American military history, who are our most undervalued leaders? Well, Nathaniel Green is probably a great example of an undervalued military commander. Um, for all intents and purposes, Nathaniel Green had largely dropped out of a lot of the narratives of the American Revolution until uh, the last 15 years or so. He's, he's really started to see a renaissance. Along that same line, Daniel Morgan, also a successful military commander in the Southern Theater, um, obviously fights the Battle of Cowpens, but is, is remarkably successful in the other campaigns that he carries out. And, and both of those individuals are largely overshadowed by, by Washington, um, overshadowed to a certain extent by Benedict Arnold. And Washington once referred to Benedict Arnold as the, the foremost hero of the Revolution. This was, of course, before the betrayal and the attempt to sell West Point. Winfield Scott, in a lot of ways, um, doesn't get a lot of attention despite being a successful field commander in the War of 1812, commanding the invasion of Mexico in, in 1840. Rather brilliantly in that case. And quite frankly, uh, one of the, the most important observers of the day was the Duke of Wellington, who pronounced that, that Winfield Scott was lost because he couldn't possibly fall back upon his supply lines and he couldn't possibly take the capital. Uh, and Wellington later had to admit that, in fact, he was wrong, that, that Scott had carried out a magnificent campaign in the face of a numerically superior opponent, outmaneuvered that opponent, and, and was able to capture the enemy's capital. So he's an individual that often doesn't get quite the, the level of attention that, that perhaps he deserves. And as we began this, you think that his uh, initial advice to Lincoln was very sound? It was, uh, not least of which was not putting Scott in charge of the fight. Uh, you know, by the time, uh, Scott's going to die in 18... Uh, 1866. So he lives long enough to see the successful outcome of the war, uh, but he is old, he is overweight, he is overwhelmed by an enormous number of, of physical ailments, uh, and, and there's really nothing that could pry him away from, from West Point, which is where he's now buried. Uh, he, he had decided to essentially retire to that area, and he's a commentator, he's an advisor, 
uh, but the chances of him being able to assume field command are, are virtually zero. He's also often blamed for his vanity, but it seems in this particular case his wisdom overcame his vanity. Well, his nickname was Old Fuss and Feathers, uh, which had a certain degree, it was tied into his love of pageantry, his, his love of proper uniforms with enormous amounts of gold braid and buttons, and, and a certain degree of flair. Uh, but this was partially a, a bit of an information campaign for the, the proponents of Zachary Taylor, uh, who, who liked to refer to him as old rough and ready, who was always ready for a fight, but not necessarily so interested in the trappings of military power. You know, Ulysses S. Grant was, was much the same way for a lot of the war, despite being a three-star general. He actually walks around in a private's uniform. Um, he doesn't particularly care for, for a lot of the, the brocade and the other, mm -hmm. the other elements of, of a nice pressed beautiful uniform. On the other hand, um, you could also think of that type of a uniform as, as a sniper's target in a lot of ways, so there may be a practical aspect of why he doesn't want to, to wear all of this, this embroidery and everything else. So have you ever found out, Lincoln once said when he heard that Grant drink, drank too much, he said, find out what he drinks and give it to all my generals. Can you, as your parting shot, tell us what he drank? Grant, uh, Grant was a whiskey man when he was a, a captain out in California. This is post-Mexican War, pre-Civil War, and he's going to wind up resigning his command. Uh, but as a, as a lieutenant and a captain, he wasn't making enough money to be able to afford anything in particular, and I seriously doubt that Grant had a specific brand of whiskey that, that he chose to drink. Now, rumors of his drunkenness then followed him over the course of his Civil War career. Uh, and it's possible that he had the occasional drink, but it's unlikely that he was imbibing beyond his limits. Um, at one point, some of his detractors within the Union Army that see him as a rising threat to tend to suggest to Lincoln that, that maybe he's drinking again and maybe he ought to be removed because he might be incapable of command. Um, Lincoln's response is effectively to say, I can't spare this man, he fights. He's the most aggressive commander on the Union side. And so Lincoln is willing to tolerate flaws in his subordinates so long as they're able to perform the mission at hand. And to this day, there's no whiskey label that bears the name Grant. To the best of my knowledge, there's no whiskey label that bears the name Grant. I, I wouldn't want to rule it out because I, I'm certainly not a whiskey expert. Well, thank you. You've, been, you've shown yourself to be an expert on a great many other things. So we'll excuse you on that, and thank you very much for spending your afternoon with us today. Thank you for the opportunity, of course.